This is a literal deploying of the spontaneous combustion rule. Spontaneous combustion rule is simple. If you pull, hold up any object in your home, it can be a lamp, it can be a coffee table, it can be your couch, it could be your grandmother's old quilt that you're holding on to. You hold up that quilt and you say, if this spontaneously combusted right now, would I feel a sense of relief? Or would I find a way to replace it? Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, TK Coleman. Hey, hey, let's create a beautiful day. Alabama's here. Hi, everybody. We've got the rest of our team in the studio, and Nicodemus is going to be joining us next week. Who knows? It might even be in the studio. <laughs> Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, a caller has a question about why people get offended when he says no to their free stuff. He doesn't want those freebies, TK. And another listener has a question about her struggles with the all or nothing mentality. Then we've got our lightning round segment, a fam's question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full three hours, that's right, three hour maximal edition of episode 415, where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash the minimalists your support keeps our podcast and youtube channel 100 advertisement free because say it with me y'all advertisements suck. suck let's start with our callers if you have a question or a comment for our show give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice recording to podcast at the minimalists.com our first question today is from jake Hello, my name is Jake Hicks. I'm from Columbus, Indiana. I'm calling because uh, I work for a company that regularly does events with free giveaways. Um, they give you t-shirts, pens. I have one where they gave us a beach towel. Almost every time I have, as a minimalist myself, rejected these items and refused to take them. Um, and... Uh, a couple of years ago, they seemed to be really upset by the fact that I would not take a company shirt, and they have never uh, let me live that down. They don't know that I'm a minimalist, um, and they see nothing wrong with handing off tons and tons of clutter and junk to other people that we don't need, and frankly, I would rather take the pay for instead. How would you respond to this issue? Thank you. <clears throat> TK, I've realized over the years that freebies are never free. You still pay for the stuff with your energy, with your time, with your attention, with the space that it occupies, not just in your home, but in your mind or in your basement or in your cabinets or your closet or in the storage locker. Or if you're like the average American, you have a two and a half car garage. I had a two and a half car garage but you can't even park one car in it. Why? Because we get a lot of stuff and a lot of those yeah. things are free things. This happened to me the other day. I was at the grocery store that we go to for lunch here and they're handing out these free drinks when you buy something. And would you like one of these free drinks? And I told her, no. And she looked at me like, no one ever says that to me. What do you mean, no? I said, oh, I just don't take free things. And she looked at me and she goes, but why? And you know what my answer to that was? I said, it's because I already have everything that I need. Ooh. And you should have seen the muscles contort on her face from a look of confusion to a look of almost bliss or satisfaction as she realized for the first time, it's okay to say no to free things. What I learned is that consumerism, it loses its leverage when you realize that you already have everything that you need. And if you go in somewhere not needing a specific result, not needing a specific thing, then those things no longer have that tug over you. I remember when I used to manage a bunch of retail stores, telecom stores, and one of the ways we would get people in high foot traffic areas to come into our store was to do these special, we called them door buster events. Yeah. 
And you'd get people to come in because you were giving away free things, whether it was free t-shirts, free pins, free beer koozies, free mugs, free tote bags, free, free, free. And people walk away from the store with all of these free things, but then what? They actually have to do something with those things. It might occupy space in your car for a week until you deal with it, but then you're also bothered by it. Every time you get in your car and you see like, oh man, I don't really want that here. And so you bring it in your home and now it's in your entryway for a week and it's taking up the space there, but it's still taking up the space in your mind. And you're thinking, why am I holding on to this? I need to find a place for this. I don't even think about getting rid of it yet. And so, oh, I can store this in a cabinet. I could put it in my basement. I could put it in the attic. I can get it out of sight and out of mind. And yes, it might be out of sight and a bit out of mind for a while, but then you stumble across it a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, and what happens? Now you have to deal with it again. You've had to deal with it all of these times over and over and over. Well, why is that? Because you said yes to something that you thought was free, but it wasn't actually free at all. It wasn't freeing. In fact, it got in the way of your freedom. It constricted you in a Mm. way that you could have never anticipated when you first said yes to that item. Yeah, and and, and I feel like deep down inside, we know it's not free, but we don't want to pay the social costs to be free, right? So like that lady in the grocery store, but sir, it's free, but it's free but you have to take it, sir. It's free. It's, it's like, that's the script that's running. That's the program. It's by the way, by the way, the way I imagine this is when she said, well, why not? And you were like, because I already have everything I need. I just imagine you throwing your arms back and your hair blowing in the wind as a cloud carries you away to free fallen by Pink Floyd. Free. That's Tom Petty, not me. Tom Petty. Petty. (laughs) I'm black. Look, look. look. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, you're black? <laughs> hey, look, Tom Petty, Boys to Men, Richard Marks. It's, it's, so it's all that. Brian McKnight, it's all the same. <laughs> That's so good. It's, it's all the same. It's, it's, it's love. It's guys with high voices singing in their falsetto. Anyway. <laughs> but there are these, man, there are these societal games, man. And we're just like, we don't, we don't want to ex- experience that pain of being different, of, of being the person who goes off script because it's like, well, I don't want to die on the hill of being the one guy that doesn't take the free thing. I don't I don't want to become the great apostle or prophet of not accepting the free T-shirt from work. So I'll just like play a cool and I'll just take it and I'll deal with the stress on my own. Because like the caller says here, like Jake says, if I if I say no and I and I take a stand, then they're going to treat me like I'm the freaking Gandhi or MLK of not taking T-shirts. So how how do you honor that fact and and deal with it healthfully because what if what if you don't want to die on the hill of not taking a t-shirt you just want to not take the t-shirt but you can't do it casually because other people are going to come at you dramatically yeah I, the way the way i think about this is sometimes there's a cost of admission if you're going to work here you might have to take home the free stuff otherwise they will ostracize you yeah But also maybe the way they're ostracizing you is the way that we do it around the studio. We're always making fun of each other, picking on each other, but in a loving, caring way where I'm really exposing my own insecurities, right? Earlier we were having this heated little discussion and I said, before we even started talking about it, I said, what I'm about to say is going to trigger Professor Sean. And jokingly, I said that because I know that I often get triggered by the same things and he knows that. And we have a level of understanding and respect. However, I want to approach Jake's question head on because he also said that these people see nothing wrong with accepting the freebies. And so for me, the other side of that is if I would have taken the drink from the cashier and it's a really expensive drink, these are like five, six dollar cans of drink. And okay, There's nothing wrong with taking it. There's also nothing wrong with saying no. The problem is when we think one side is right or wrong. What is appropriate for you, it has a whole bunch of, well, uh, potential factors that we need to consider. And one of those factors is what's the cost of admission for working here? The cost of, of admission for working here might be that they request that you bring some 
free bees home so that you're a part of the club, you're a part of the group. Now, you can say no to that or you can find a different job as well. I'm not suggesting you do either one of those things, but understand those are possibilities. You can walk away. I'm thinking about, though, since Jake is in Columbus, Indiana, I don't know if you've ever been to Columbus, Indiana, not far from where you grew up in Chicago, but it is like the mid-century modern capital of the Midwest. Some of the most stunning architecture in the entire world is in Columbus, Indiana. In fact, I made a film about this. It's called Columbus. And it's it's a stunning film. And the artwork that is constructed there is all stunning. But why is it so beautiful? It's beautiful because of its level of restraint. If I take a beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright home or a Mies van der Rohe building and then cram it full of a bunch of freebies and tchotchkes, what happens? This has become more beautiful. Those things get in the way of the beauty. And that's what Jake's recognizing with his own life. Although one thing happened with him that I would be careful of. And that one thing is, he said, I've refused those things. Hmm. Well, Anthony DeMello often says that as soon as we renounce something, we're forever tied to it. So it's not that I'm renouncing stuff. I'm certainly not renouncing freebies, but I'm also not clamoring for them either. If I show up with a disposition of, I already have everything I need, but then someone offers me something for free and I genuinely think it will enhance my life, okay, then I will consider taking it. But I'm always weary of free mm. because if someone is just giving me something for free, it's not like, a benevolent person has showed up. Now, TK, you buy me coffee sometimes or I'll buy you coffee. That, I guess, is accepting a free thing, but it's with a completely different spirit than if I'm walking through a mall and someone has a free item, buy one, get three free at Joseph A. Bank or something. It's not really free then. These corporations aren't trying to just make you feel better by bestowing their products on you for free. We want you to feel good about yourself. So we created this shirt or we created yeah. this car. Or we created these sneakers so that you'll feel built. You'll just feel better about yourself. No, they want to sell you something. Mm -hmm. And that is why they're giving it to you for free. And by the way, you do have the permission to opt out. So one of the phrases Jake used in this question was something along the lines of when I say no, they don't let me live it down. Mm. I would zoom in on that. What does that mean? They won't let me live it down. Clearly, they keep you around, so it doesn't mean they fired you because of it. That sounds a little bit, little bit like they give me a hard time, and boy, that doesn't really feel good. But sometimes that hard time is the upfront cost you have to pay in order to rewrite your script and create a new story in other people's minds about how you're going to show up in their world. And when you have a reputation for maybe being a little squirmish with it, or being a little soft-spoken or being so agreeable, those first few times you say no, people are going to react to that as if it's a really dramatic e event and they may not believe it. They may give you a hard time because they genuinely think that it has power in your life, maybe because you have a history of being moved by those hard times. But when you can stand firm, not being squirmish like, oh, well, I wish I could take a t-shirt. You don't wish you could. You just don't want one. I wish I could, but, uh, I, you know, you know, you know, you don't, you don't want to go into the, the Terrence Howard. Well, I really want a t-shirt, baby, but I, you know, I, I, I'm afraid, you know, you don't <laughs> want to do that, but you also don't want to get over defensive and, and start being like, well, no, this is stupid because that's just another way of being squirmish. And people can see that, oh, if I give you a hard time, I might be able to get a reaction. You can just say, no, I'm good. And if they joke, you can laugh at the joke with them. You can yeah. maybe feed into it and, and, and like make an additional joke about yourself or you can just not react at all. And after maybe four, five, six, seven times, people just start to accept, hey man, that's Jake. Jake's not the type of dude that's going to take a t-shirt and then they leave it alone. They, give, they stop giving you a hard time and they realize that nothing comes of it. Our next question is from Alicia. Hey everybody, my name is Alicia and I'm from Missouri. And I want to start off by just giving my gratitude um, for all your valuable insights and knowledge that you give to your Patreon members. It is truly something I look forward to listening to every week. Um, I do have a question regarding a challenge that I am facing and I would really appreciate any input that you have. I often struggle with the all or nothing mentality. Not only when it comes to decluttering, but any major task or goal that I have, 
this becomes a major roadblock for me. It's whenever I can't devote 100% of my time and focus to a task until it's complete, I find it incredibly difficult to make any progress. I know that deep down, this is just not simply feasible. I can't give my undivided attention to every single aspect of life, including decluttering a 2,000 square foot home and a 40 by 60 barn. There is just no way I can just put all my energy and time until these are complete while having daily responsibilities and just living your life in general. But it's a constant battle I struggle with because whenever I focus and get your tunnel vision and give your 100% to one area, another area gets neglected and it's a vicious cycle that never seems to end for me. So any insights that you can give to help would be greatly appreciated. And thank you so much again and have a blessed day. Alicia, this is an interesting question because it's a question about attention and what we focus on and how exhausting it can be to focus on the things we don't want to focus on. However, the flip side of that is when we're focused on something that we enjoy doing, that we can immerse ourselves in, we're never worried about, can I give my attention? In fact, it doesn't even feel like I'm doing anything. I'm merely being, I'm existing in the presence of that action. But doing everything all the time everything you want to do, especially all the time, leaves very little room for doing nothing, for just being. Mm. What's the, was it Hamlet, uh, to be or not to be? That is the question, Alabama. That's correct. And so maybe if I were to- Not Tom Petty. Not Tom Petty. (laughs) Make it sure. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if I were to rephrase it, I would say to be or to do, that is the question. Quite often we feel like there's something that must be done. And I- I'm not allowed to feel happy, at peace, excited, joy, whatever pleasant emotion you associate with finishing the task. I'm not allowed to feel that until I am finished with this task, with decluttering a barn or decluttering a 2,000 square foot home. But is it possible to do the dishes and be present? To actually be, to enjoy the process of doing that? Of course it is. Is it possible to sweep and mop your floor, hopefully in that order, and still enjoy the process, be present, to actually witness it right there in front of you? Well, of course it is. The alternative is I need to hurry up and get through this. My attention is toward the horizon instead of what's going on in front of me. And there are obviously some meditative practices that you can do to ground yourself in whatever you're doing. But it's really about paying attention to whatever's going on in front of you. Pausing and not reacting, not feeling like something else must be done. Whatever I'm doing right now or not doing right now Mm. is completely sufficient. And I don't need anything more than this. Yes, other things will come up. I'm going to eat later. But I don't need to focus on the lunch I'm going to have later today while we're having this podcast right now. If I'm focused on that, then I'm not right here right now. Yeah. Man, that tension, when you've got something that needs to happen or you've got something that you need to clean up or declutter, that tension can just make you feel so uncomfortable that you feel like you need a sabbatical or a day off. You need the whole world to stop so that you can do that thing to get rid of the tension that it being undone makes you feel. And I think part of the solution here is having a bigger reason for doing things than merely escaping or getting rid of tension. This is where Robert Fritz's insight of the distinction between creativity and problem solving becomes so useful, where problem solving is the management or elimination of what you don't want, whereas creativity is the bringing forth or production of what you do want. Problem solving is a part of the creative process, but it's not a substitute for the creative process. And if all your effort is done just to get rid of the stuff that you don't want, you're so disconnected from creative energy that you have nothing life-giving going on in this process. And so you feel the need to like get rid of all your problems at once because you can't get rid of the tension because you don't have anything to live for. So you just got to get rid of the tension. But if you, if you look at the things that need to be done, as not just problems to be managed or eliminated, 
but as part of a broader creative process where you are designing a life and moving things from here to there, getting rid of that, simplifying this is part of this life as art designing process. Then you can say, all right, today I can show up and I can do this and I'll be unfinished, but my predominant feeling will be one of joy because I will have moved closer to the life that I want. I will have moved more deeply into the life that I want to live versus this attitude that says, oh, I didn't get it done. And so I still feel some tension. It's kind of like when you're traveling, if you're going from Chicago to Nashville for the overwhelming majority of your trip, you are not in Nashville. But you don't look at it as like, man, I've been driving for six hours and I'm still not in Nashville. Well, of course, you're still not in Nashville, but you're also not in Chicago either. You're in some other cool place and you're focusing on that and you're checking out the scenery there because you understand that that trip is a journey of getting somewhere, not escaping somewhere. So don't look at simplification and decluttering as just about eliminating problems and managing your attention. Look at it as a lifestyle design, as a creative process. And then as you take one step at a time and spread it out over time, you'll get to feel a little bit more joy as you move more deeply in the process. And that gives you the strength to handle the tension. I so identify with Alicia here because I am her in so many respects. This even happened to me last night. We're doing this thing, and I'll talk about it later on the podcast, but we're doing this thing where we're combining our two YouTube channels from two to one. There's a whole bunch of reasons that we're doing it, but ultimately it's because we want to simplify things. And last night I had concerns about some of the mechanics behind that. And all of a sudden what pops in my head is like, I need to get this done right now. And the tension that is going on in my mind, this needs to be fixed. It needs to be corrected. It needs to be done. And what do we talk to Dr. John Deloney about? That anxiety that creeps up from that is an alarm. There's something that I, I would like to do something. The way reality is does not currently comport with my idea of reality. And Alicia's idea of reality is I will have a decluttered home. I will have a minimalist life. I will have a barn that doesn't have all the things in it. Right. And you will have those things, right? But it doesn't mean that you'll get to an end point. When you get to the horizon, there's always a new horizon. And so you'll get to the point where you've minimized all of your things. And then you'll have to bring some new things in. You have to let go of some old things that are no longer serving you, that are serving you today. And so you'll keep moving in that direction of simplification and understanding what adds value to your life, what is essential, what enhances your life, what is junk. And as you mature, the things tend to switch categories on you as well. The thing that was so precious to you when you were five years old is not even a memory now. You don't even think about it or worry about it. And the same thing is true with today. All those problems that were so focused on problem solving, man, you're not even going to think about them a year from now. Certainly not a decade from now. I think about when we first started Mm -hmm. The Minimalists. You know, interestingly, I'm far less successful today than I have been in the past. If I were to use my old metrics to measure success, monetarily, I've made more money than I make right now. But also in terms of aggregating eyeballs onto me or going out on a hundred tour stops in one year. Like if I'm measuring success through metrics, that's one way to measure it, right? But if I were to go do those same things now, Mm. I wouldn't feel the same level of success that I did back then. I've done them at this point. If I try to do them over and over and over, you don't feel success about that. Just like tying your shoe man, I felt great the first time I tied my shoe. Yeah. But if I do it now, I've just done it because I need to tie my shoes so I can walk out of the house. Yeah. Hey, uh, I have an anecdote that might be uh, relevant too. When I was on my way to work this morning, um, I opened up YouTube on my phone before I started driving to just kind of see what new videos are out. And I have this problem of finding everything to be interesting. I'm just like infinitely curious. And I'm currently working through this lecture series on history. And it's valuable to me because I know that a year from now when I'm done with that, I'm going to be proud of having stuck with it. and I'm going to value what I know. But when I opened up YouTube, I saw there was a new video about the problems with the culture of the Miami Heat. 
And I was like, oh, that looks really good. Pat Riley was on the thumbnail too. And I'm thinking, well, this is really important because, uh, you know, Damian Lillard uh, just got traded to the Bucks, and they were trying to get him. And did they fail to get him because of a cultural problem? This is going to be significant come playoff time. And this curiosity I have about Miami Heat culture felt so important in the moment. And there was this other voice that says, no, 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 man. Just push the play button on Audible. Open up Audible, push the play button and get started on your history lecture. It's less interesting than this, but you'll be proud of having made that choice. And I go, ah, and so I do it. But within 10 minutes of driving and listening to the lecture, I'm so into it. And it's just as interesting as the Miami Heat game or the Miami Heat uh, uh, video. But I, I tell that story just because there are some things that require a lot of faith and discipline up front to get started on. And it, it makes us kind of feel like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not going to enjoy it. It's not going to be fun as, as my ideal. But if you just get started and have a little faith, after a while, it starts to feel good. And you no longer have to have faith because you're in the middle of a process that's rewarding you for doing what's healthy. And in a similar way, you don't have to have faith in anything that we're saying right now in order to try something new. Just be willing to try decluttering the things in your life one step at a time, one day at a time. And I believe that once you start getting in the process, you're gonna start getting rewarded from that process and it's gonna feel so good. You're gonna say, why did I ever feel like I needed to have a complete day or a complete year off just to do these things? It feels so good to take a step at a time. Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and X and threads. We're at The Minimalists on those platforms. During the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes over at theminimalists.com. In fact, if you sign up for our email list, We'll send the show notes right to your inbox every Monday with all of our minimal maxims from the week. You can get on our emails for free. We'll never send you spam. We'll never send you junk. We'll never send you advertisements, but we will send you the show notes as well as any new essays we put out. Theminimalists.email if you'd like to get on that email list. TK, what's your favorite race? Actually, <laughs> what's your least favorite race? Mine is the rat race. Heather has a question for us. <laughs> <laughs> we lost our home to the Kelowna fires. When you see 30 years of your life in a couple of inches of ash, it changes your perspective. I never want to overspend or seek crap I don't need again. What can I do to stay out of the stuff rat race? Mm. The rat race is definitely my least favorite race. Mm. Star. And I ran it. I was a rat race marathon runner for a very long time. From age 18 until 30, I was working 80 plus hours most weeks mm. and uh, 362 days a year. I really participated in that race. I would, took off three days a year. It was Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving and Easter. Those are the three days that our stores were closed. Besides that, I was always, always working. And I was, I was a... Uh, a rat in that rat race. You got something pithy for us, TK? Yeah. You know, the uh, the best way to escape a rat race is to cease being a rat. Mm. A rat can never get out of a rat race because a rat needs the cheese. And no matter what, if it stays out of the race, it's just going to regret it or it's just going to suffer because it's a rat. And so the way out of the rat race isn't to go run a different race. It's to cease being a rat altogether. I believe it was Jackie Gleason who said that the thing about rat races is that you're still a rat at the end. <laughs> and I believe it was Philip K. Dick who says that basically in a rat race, you've got uh, cheese that's been placed there, an activity that's been designed for you, a setting that has been orchestrated all by another species. Think about that. How many things are we pursuing in life that have been placed before us and they are a manifestation of desires that don't even belong to us? And so the way you opt out of this life is not merely by saying, I'm not going to play society's games, but I'm also going to purify myself of needing the praise and the prizes that society gives to the people who play those games. I'm okay with knowing that I'm good with myself and my family. What you're talking about here is something I realized after a dozen years climbing the corporate ladder. And I think it dovetails perfectly onto what you were talking about. 
The person who wins the rat race slowly mutates into a rabies-infested rodent <laughs> during the competition. I was constantly competing. I didn't know why. Someone handed me, like, I need to be the best salesperson. I need to be the best manager. I need to be the best regional manager. And I'm competing in a way. I don't even know what I'm really competing for. I know that there is some sort of cheese on the other end of this, but I don't even really know what it is. I thought it was going to be happiness or joy or contentment, but it never was. It was always more stress, more anxiety, with momentary blips of pleasure, of satisfaction, of temporary satiation. But then I got right back into that maze and I continued to run the rat race. And at time, I didn't start out as a rat, but I mutated into some sort of rodent that was like rabies infested because it was always more, 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 more. I need to get more, more cheese, faster, better, stronger, improve, improve, get better, better, better. But why? What am I chasing after? And it turns mm. out I didn't even know what I was chasing. And I think we get back to Heather's question and address it head on here. You lose your home in a fire. I couldn't tell you how many times We've done 10 tours of the last 12 or 13 years. How many times someone has come up to me during the hug line at the end of the event? This has happened more than I could count on both hands. And their house was ruined. Usually it's from a fire. Maybe it caught on fire. There was a fire. In fact, there was one fire I wrote about in our last book, Love People Use Things. The fire is a catalyst for everything that else that changes in their life. Because in that moment, when all of their possessions go up in smoke, so does all of the stories that they told themselves about those possessions. Otherwise, they keep clinging to the story and they become miserable. But in a way, when you're forced to let go of those things all at once, you start looking at the rest of your life and saying, huh, what else can I let go of? I was able to let go of that? What else can I let go of? Maybe I can let go of a marriage that is abusive. Maybe I can let go of a toxic coworker who's always taking up my time but never contributing to the relationship at all. Maybe I can give up the career that is not fulfilling to me anymore. Maybe I can let go of some family members who, you know what? They're abusive to me in all these other ways, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. They're gaslighting me. Maybe I can let go of the people in my life now that I've let go of some of the things. I was forced to let go of this. Let me take an inventory of the rest of my life. What else can I let go of? There's a relationship here between our stuff and our friends. And there's something we can learn from what it takes to build healthy relationships that can be applied to our stuff. And that is the question, what survives the fire? If you look at the people in your life, who are the people that survive the fire? When you go through hard times, when you're not so pleasant and fun to be around, when you're going through great difficulty and you don't feel valuable to everyone, who are the people that stick with you? Who are the people that survive the fire? You can do that same thing with your possessions. You can look around and say, what survives the fire? Okay, that table doesn't, that TV doesn't, that couch doesn't. Okay, those are like the friends who are fun, but who aren't and ride or die. I can keep them around as long as it's convenient and doesn't cost too much. But what survives the fire? And when I identify those things, that's what I fight for. That's what I really go to bat for. This is a literal deploying of the spontaneous combustion rule. Spontaneous combustion rule is simple. If you pull, hold up any object in your home, it can be a lamp. It can be a coffee table. It could be your couch. It could be your grandmother's old quilt that you're holding on to. You hold up that quilt and you say, if this spontaneously combusted right now, would I feel a sense of relief? Or would I find a way to replace it? For some things, we're going to replace them. But other things, we're going to feel incredibly relieved. So when someone has a fire or a flood or a natural disaster that destroys their home, what are the things you're going to replace? Because now's an opportunity. You just have a clean slate now. And a decade from now, you'll look back and say, oh, maybe you'll look back and say, that's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah. 
We're going to check in with our Patreon Zoom call in a moment. But first, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Actually, I've got at least two, maybe three things for you, TK. So when we first started TheMinimalists.com, it was just a blog to catalog Ryan's and my story. And it was a creative opportunity for for me to write essays because I'd always written fiction. And Ryan came to me with this idea of like, you want to start talking about the simplifying thing we've done? Because he was doing his packing party. I had spent eight months simplifying my life, letting go of excess stuff and dealing with my mom's things, letting go of her things. And it was a creative outlet for me to write about the letting go process. And so we started theminimalists.com. I, I couldn't even spell HTML at the time, but I, <laughs> I, I figured out how to cobble together a simple blog and to make it really beautiful and, and elegant. And people started writing in and say, I'm getting a lot of value from your writing, but how did you start your blog? Like, what widgets are you using here? What plugins are you using? Tell me about SEO. And do you use WordPress or do you use some other site? And I got so many questions after we started building up an audience. Because in the first year, we had about 100,000 people who were reading the blog. And more and more and more questions started coming in. I was tired of responding to emails. So I wrote this really long blog post called How to Start a Successful Blog Today. And what I realized, I spent like 100 hours putting together this blog. But with the lessons I learned, you can do it in about an hour now. Because when I first Mm. started, I was trying to do HTML coding and all this other stuff. I just didn't know what to do. And so many people also didn't know what to do. So 13 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever it was, I wrote this blog post called How to Start a Successful Blog. And every year I have updated. I'm working on the 2024 edition of that right now. By the time this episode comes out, it will be updated with the most up-to-date information about our blog, how we started the whole soup to nuts approach, literally like registering the domain and how do I use WordPress and what are alternatives to WordPress if I don't want to go that route? Are there free ways to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So many questions, including a bunch of frequently asked questions. And then Professor Sean, Danny Unknown, and I came in here uh, a few days ago, Alabama helped us out as well. And we recorded a bunch of videos for this blog post as well, because people had different questions, frequently asked questions. And so what we did is we just said, oh, how does how do the minimalists make money from their blog? You know, here are five different ways you can make money if you're blogging. Or um, if I, what if I'm worried about SEO? How do I optimize my website for search engines, et cetera, et cetera. So anyone who's interested in expressing themselves through writing creatively. I got to say this, starting a blog was literally the best thing that I've ever done as a creative outlet for at least two reasons. One is I finally had people who were reading my words. Even if it was 50 people, it was more than all the rejection letters I got from agents and publishers. Now someone was saying yes to my writing, not no, 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 slamming the door on my face. And so I was building an audience and I was expressing myself creatively and it improved my writing dramatically by doing that, getting that instant feedback. You know, you've done blogging challenges in the past. And the second thing it did is it opened up all these other vehicles for me. When we started theminimalists.com, I never, I didn't even know what a podcast was. Yeah. I never anticipated starting a podcast. I never anticipated having two films on Netflix, one of which is Emmy nominated. I never expected to be a New York Times bestselling author. I never expected to be featured in the New Yorker and in People Magazine and in New York Times and at the the Pittsburgh (laughs) Post-Gazette. You're starting to sound like Floyd Mayweather now. Like, <laughs> hey, I never expected to have all this money. I never expected to have these 50 cars. I never. I didn't expect all of the things that happened. And by the way, if I had that expectation, go, I'm going to start a blog so I can get all of these things, mm-hmm. I probably would have felt like a failure. But all of those things started because of one thing. I learned how to start a blog. Mm-hmm. And if you want a creative outlet, you can read that entire, the updated version, How to Start a Successful Blog in 2024 over at theminimalists.com slash blog. It's literally my step-by-step approach, exactly how I followed because I was tired of sending y'all emails about everything that I did. So it's all there in one spot, theminimalists.com slash blog. And by the time this comes out, we should have a few videos on that post as well. So you can even watch the videos that where I answer your questions. 
Speaking of answering your questions, people also reach out for what? Book recommendations. Oh, you're a yeah. writer and you read a lot. What are some of your favorite books? So I've really enjoyed this experiment I've been doing on my personal Instagram account, at Joshua Fields Milburn. I said, for the course of 30 days, I'm going to go and share 30 of my favorite books from all over mm. the place. Poetry, anthologies, some of my favorite novels, short story collections, self-help books, spirituality guides, and everything in between. And I've had a lot of people commenting about what their favorite books are as well. You can send me a DM with your favorite book. I'll check out some of those for sure. But I have cataloged all of them now on my Instagram account. You don't even have to follow me. You can go just to at Joshua Fields Milburn and you click that highlight there that says books and you can see all the books that I've been sharing over the course of this month. And if you are one of our Patreon subscribers and you don't subscribe to any social media, I've had a few patrons point this out. Don't worry, I'm gonna share it on Patreon as well as a blog post over there on Patreon. So you can check out all 30 of those books at Joshua Fields Milburn on Instagram. I have one last thing, and this one's important. So listen up. We're trying to simplify, TK. And we have two YouTube channels, or at least we had two YouTube channels. And I decided, after talking to a consultant, Professor Sean and I, we decided that we want to leave YouTube. Sort of. (laughs) We're combining our YouTube channels into one. Why are we doing this? Well, it's to simplify things. We're always looking for different ways to simplify. But a few years ago, we split off our YouTube channel. We always had one YouTube channel, was at The Minimalists. And then we got some really good advice at the time, was you wanna split off your channel into two because you have these long form podcast episodes and YouTube doesn't play well when you intermingle the material of short form content and long form content, the long podcasts and the short clips. And so we were being penalized for what? For not having the same exact clips posted over and over and over. So we said, let's just make a separate second channel and we'll call it the minimalist podcast. And we did that. And, uh, but recently it's come to our attention that, you know what? It's actually much, much better for us to just have one YouTube channel, not worry about posting in two places. So what we're doing is that podcast channel, it's been out there for three years. We're just making it, it's an archives channel, everything that's on there, old materials, but everything we're posting going forward is on The Minimalist's main channel, youtube.com slash The Minimalist's. You can find all of our long form podcasts there. You can find any short clips we have there. We're also working on some new video essay series that you're absolutely going to love. Uh, TK and I, I think we're even going to get Ryan involved when he's in town coming up next week. Um, we're doing these video essays where you can, uh, you'll can you be able to check those out. YouTube.com slash The Minimalist about simple living and giving you different perspectives on success doesn't exist or what is clutter really? Mm. Let's get beyond the stuff. What is clutter? And so we have all these different essay ideas and Danny's doing the most artistic job filming these. I mean, stunning cinematography with what Danny's doing, the way he's editing it together. And we're doing all this location scouting. And regardless, our YouTube channels are hundred percent advertisement free. So I don't care we're not doing this to earn revenue from those. We're doing it to create art that I think will resonate with people and bring them into our ecosystem. If you're interested, head on over to youtube.com slash the minimalists. That is the only place where we'll be posting videos for the foreseeable future. Any thoughts about that, TK? I just want to let everybody know, man, that uh, Danny's methods are unknown. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Alabama, let's check in with our uh, Patreon uh, live stream. We uh, do this Patreon Zoom. We call it the Friday Afternoon Minimalist Zoom. First Friday of every month, we have a Zoom call with our patrons. You can show up to that. You can be a fly on the wall, turn your camera off, turn your mic off, or turn your camera on, turn your mic on, interact with us, have a Zoom call with the minimalists. Nicodemus joins us. TK is there. Alabama, the rest of our team joins us as well. We got a question right now? We do. This one comes from Luciana. How do you balance decluttering and making space to live against a desire to hold on to things for a potential yet unrealized future? This contradiction feels like a bigger version of the just-in-case items dilemma. 
It is. It's still a just-in-case item. If you're holding on to something for some hypothetical future, well, then you're holding on to it just in case. Now, I'm not the declutter police. I'm not going to show up to your house and say you can't hold on to anything just in case. But there's a difference between holding on to something just in case and just for when. A just for when item is like, hey, I don't know exactly when I'm going to use this, but I just bought a whole pack of toilet paper and I know I'm going to need more than one square of toilet paper. So I'm going to hold on to this just for when I need it. But even there, there's a potential burden. If I buy an entire pallet of toilet paper, where am I going to store it? And I don't have anywhere to store it. It's just going to get in the way. And that's the problem with just-in-case items. They tend to get in the way. You don't have a specific use for it, and we can justify holding on to anything just in case. But I think that's why those are the three most dangerous words in the English language, because they do justify this hoarding. And it makes the hoarding even feel good or righteous. You know what? I'm not using it right now, but I'll hold on to it someday because just in case I need it. Yeah. You know, I think the first question you have to ask is, what is it compromising for me to hold on to? to, uh, Or let me rephrase that. What am I compromising by holding on to this? And if the answer is nothing, then you're safe, you're fine. But given that we all have a limited amount of time and energy and space and attention and the ability to manage things, we do have to ask that question. And if if it compromises something that's significant, that moves you to the next question, which is, what do I want to bet on? Just in case is always a bet. What you're betting on is not just that um, I'm going to have some sort of problem that will cause me to need this possession. You're also betting on the possibility that you'll be able to be as effective and joyful as you need to be in spite of having the presence of this thing that you believe compromises something significant in your life. Is that how you want to place your bets? I tend to want to place my bets in how I can show up for my life and my dreams and my creative projects and my relationships when my energy is uncompromised. So you've got to decide which way do you want to bet. But keep in mind, just in case is always a gamble on more than one thing. I like that. What's the cost of holding on to this is a question we rarely ask. I'm going to hold on to this just in case I might need it someday because I don't want to spend the money to replace it in the future. I don't want to incur that cost. What's the cost of holding on to this? What's the emotional cost? What's the psychological weight of holding on to this? And then, oh, how much is it going to save me if I'm willing to let go? I think about a dramatic case, like you live in a city that you hate, like it's got a lot of crime, you don't like the aesthetics, you don't like the people around you, but you think to yourself, ah, I'm going to stay here just in case this place is like booming in five years and Mm. everybody wants to be here and the property values go up just in case. Now we can see the fallacy inherent in that reason being because it's clear to us in that instance that you're not just betting on this neighborhood getting great, but you're also betting on your ability to be happy and safe and effective and healthy in spite of the fact that it's not great right now and may not be great for a long time. And you want to do that with your stuff as well. See both sides of that bet. Man, I love these Friday afternoon minimalist Zooms. We'll check in with another question on the private podcast. A whole lot more coming up on the private podcast. But first, Alabama, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, minimalists. Uh, I'm listening to your House Full of Junk episode, and I'm responding with a suggestion for the guy that works at the company that likes to have dress-up days. And I'm wondering why no one has suggested a closet full of resources for people who don't want to go out and buy the outfit and who don't want to have to have that thing at home. Because what I'm hearing in this in this uh, caller is that he would participate, but he doesn't want to spend the money and he doesn't want to add more stuff to his life. So why not create a resource closet for anybody who wants to add or share? And then it just lives there because that's where the event lives. That's where the energy of this whole undertaking lives. It's in the workplace. It doesn't mean that people have to have all of these outfits at home if they don't want to. And it's in the spirit of sharing and in the spirit of non-attachment and in the spirit of keeping the vibe of that workplace going. Thank you so much for your work and uh, keep it up. 
All right, y'all, we'll see you on Patreon for the full three-hour maximal edition of episode 415, which includes answers to a bunch more questions like, how do I let go of clothes I don't like if my friends think I'm crazy for getting rid of them? How do we teach the next generation about contentment, worth, and moderation? What do I do if I feel suicidal because I'm experiencing deep despair about my life situation? And TK, we talk about a fearful, cowardly podcaster who recently deplatformed the minimalists. Uh 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 uh. Plus, we got a bunch more over there on the minimalist private podcast. Also, this week, a private minimalist home tour from one of our listeners. It is an aggressively simple bedroom with a view. I tell you, it doesn't get any more minimalist than this. Plus, we got all that and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear it all, check out The Minimalist Private Podcast, patreon.com slash The Minimalist, or click the link in the description. You can subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly Maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. And if you're still on the fence, Patreon is now offering free trials. So if you'd like to test drive our private podcast, you can do so for free for seven days. That is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things. Because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it